Aha, okay. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to Kansas City Oasis. I am Nikki Actipis. I will be your MC today. So if you have never been here before, or if you have, and just like hearing what we are up to, we are a secular nonprofit here in Kansas City. We serve not only the Missouri side, but the Kansas side and the greater KC area. And we have five core values. And those are people are more important than beliefs. Reality is known through reason. Human hands solve human problems. Meaning comes from making a difference and be accepting and be accepted. So we are really into our core values here. Um, we try to have our speakers and musicians embody at least one of those. Um, that's how we we book them for the most part. And today is no different. So we have an awesome musician today. We have Rick Klug will be our musician. Yours truly will be the MC because I was suckered into it by Mark and Jason. And we have our community in back all the way from Ohio. Uh, Mark Phillips. So without further ado, and without having to inflict too much uh, havoc on your ears with my voice today, I'm going to introduce Rick or have Rick introduce himself um, and then play us some music. So let me get, or Jason, if you would like to get Rick up on, on screen, that'd be awesome. Hello. Good morning, Rick. So if you, I think you would do an awesome job of introducing yourself and um, yeah, just, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. And then whenever you are ready to play that, the time is yours. Okay, cool. The hearing my voice in here is kind of weird, but um, I'm Rick. Uh, this is called a hand pan and um, I, First off, they were invented, if nobody knows what the handpan is, it was invented in 2000 in Switzerland, and they were completely unobtainable. Uh, you had to handwrite the company a letter. If they approved you, there would be a three-year wait to get an instrument, uh, and you'd have to go to Switzerland to get it. Um, I clearly knew that wasn't going to happen. And then... Um, there's a second company, uh, weirdly in Farmington, Missouri. They had a 30,000 person waiting list. Uh, they had a lottery. You had to win to get it. There'd be a three plus year wait. Uh, couldn't go that route either. But what I did do back then, I owned a screen printing company and I wrote them and asked if they would trade. And trading was something they do. So my first instrument I got as a traded instrument, I got it. Uh, in about a month, which was pretty miraculous. Um, I'm on my fifth and sixth instrument now, and like I was telling Jason, I normally play two hand bands together, but my other one I sent to a company to have completely reworked, so I'm down to what this is, which is an E major. So this uh, is the coolest instrument I've ever heard. I, I just can't say enough about it. So I guess, I guess I'll just start playing. Set this up. Thank you. 
So, I guess that's one. <laughs> I, li I like the hands, Jason. Okay, um, let's see. Let's see what happens. Song two. I like clapping. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know how many of the little hand claps, the silent hand claps you can see are the little emojis happening in um, the chat here. Excuse me. Um, but I will, I will, I think I can speak for most folks here. Uh, probably the best and most peaceful way to start a Sunday. So thank you so much. That's nice. Um, thank you. And I, I think, I think, I think that's the consensus. I'm going to, I'm going to say that's the consensus. Sorry, y'all. Um, well, before, before, uh, we give you a break and, uh, move on to the next part of our program. I guess out of my own personal curiosity, because Jason said something about you being a sound engineer. Yes. And I'm just over here reminiscing about video games and like the opening um, sequences for like video games. Uh, have you ever considered that might be part of what you want to be up to is like making music for for such such things like video games and all of that? Uh, you know, I, I haven't thought about that. Um, I, I'll make music for anything. Uh, mostly I play for the yoga community. Um, okay. I've been super fortunate to, like I said, I went to Greece uh, for a yoga retreat. I played for the Kaufman Performing Arts Center, the Kemper, the uh, Nelson. Um, this thing really changed my life. Um, it. It's taken me all over the world, and um, the community is just amazing. Um, there are what's called gatherings all over the world, and it's a handpan gathering. And normally, it's in a like a really cool retreat center, and you've got 100, 150 handpan players with maybe 200 handpans for five or six days. We we have a we have a custom chef at every one of them. Um, and you just hang out and do handpan all week. Uh, it's sublime. It's sublime. That sounds absolute. I can only imagine what that must sound like. Can like, I've only ever heard a few people play them in my life. Uh, so I can only imagine what like a group of y'all together sounds like that. I just imagine it being just well, in the main room, it sounds like shit. <laughs> Be sorry, I should I can't say that. Um, you, you are you are welcome to say that. We are okay. There is no censoring here. The reason why is these are these are diatonic, so they're a seven note scale. You can't just grab A and B handpan and play together, because it may be in a completely dissonant scale. So then you get. 60 people playing in a room with all these different hand pans, it, it, it gets pretty gross pretty quickly. Um, but the cool thing, when you go to a hand pan gathering, you have a group of 100 plus people that you trust because they also have an instrument as precious as yours. So you just leave your instrument and go from group to group where the hand pans have migrated to where those hand pans play together. And then you might have six or ten handpans playing in the same key, and that truly is uh, angelic. All right, yeah, it's um, it reminds me of, um, oh goodness, I can't I can't remember. This is me blanking today, but I've I like to read articles about musical instruments and uh, violins from like some of the earliest violins that were just like high key, very precious violins um they've had to do recordings of them because violins um and you might be aware of this um eventually fall silent like they're not playable anymore after a while because of they become too fragile or whatever um so like when you're describing to me how precious these instruments are that makes me think of those articles i've read about um these really precious um beautiful sounding violins so my point is, uh, it is an absolute treat to get to hear this today. And Kathy in the chat would like to know more about the retreats. So if you would like yeah. to provide that some context in the chat, um, or hopefully y'all get put into the same breakout room so you can talk about it, that would, I think that would uh, make Kathy happy. Okay, that's great. And they're, they are open to anybody. 
and they they don't try and make money on them so like the first hand pen gatherings were only like three or four hundred bucks and that included your food your board the entire week so okay yeah if you if you would like to provide our community with that information that would be awesome um because i imagine they're not the only one wondering about it just the only one that's asked so far and so. just just so you know these aren't precious like that violin these are tuned with a hammer it's the most bizarre thing to see these thing tuned because you'll be seeing somebody playing on it and then they'll hit it with a hammer <laughs> because they're working on a note and it's like what 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 just happened and then so they they're in perfect pitch so it's you, still it's still pretty cool it's yeah. that's it's beauty out of violence that's a good way of putting it well, thank you so much for being here, and we will see you after our coffee break. Great. Nikki, you're muted. I'm back to being muted. Jason is trying to shut me up already, but it's it's too late, Jason. You told me to do this, so that's why I'm here. Um, so if you are unfamiliar with or even if you're familiar with community moments here at Kansas City Oasis are usually given by somebody who's been within our community for a while, usually about uh, maybe a vacation or something informative um, that they would like to say, or maybe just a small rant they would like to get off their chest. And today it's me, Tada. Um, and we're doing things a little bit differently today because Jason suggested that I come and speak about my personal experience um, with COVID-19 and Mark Dixon agreed to let it happen. Um, so y'all have those two to blame for the situation y'all in this morning. Um, so with that being said, uh, what I wanted to start off with was sharing a particular uh, meme, not my emails, this guy right here. Um, so little known fact about me, I grew up on Seinfeld field as a child of the nineties, um, without cable television. So just about any, you can always relate something in life, a situation in life to Seinfeld, um, unfortunately or fortunately. And, uh, when I saw this meme for the first time, I, cackled because that's what I do as a human. It's very terrifying. Uh, when I cackle, I don't do it out in public a lot. Um, but for those of you, if this is hard to see, it says me try and find my 14th booster pass uh, for the Omicron variant so I can buy a sandwich. Uh, 2025 colorization. And it's the scene where George Costanza, who has this ridiculously large wallet, um, and this is a scene where I think it eventually burst and all the papers fly out and he's very upset um but he, that he's holding his wallet and it looks like a sandwich itself because all of this crap is stuffed in there um so this is it resonated with me because my mom and i have talked about this a lot that we will continue to get our boosters for covid19 um as long as they come out uh because vaccines are effective they are safe um, and it's the responsible thing to do. It is 150% the responsible thing to do. I am saying that as a scientist, I am saying that as somebody who has had multiple hundreds of vaccines probably in their lifetime, that's probably an exaggeration, maybe not. Vaccines are safe, safe and effective. And when we say effective, uh, nothing is 100 percent effective um so maybe in the chat and maybe you don't have to but if you have ever gotten a flu vaccine or you've ever gotten a tetanus booster or you have ever got your t t dip, dip or whatever i can't even remember the acronym today um maybe in the chat you can tell us about that uh because some of those vaccines are yearly vaccines right the flu vaccine is we know that, um, well, maybe you don't know, but with the flu vaccine, it's not just that there's one type of flu that is going around. Scientists play the statistical game every year of 
uh, what flu variants are going to be prevalent in, in the year to come or the flu season that's upcoming. But that does not mean if you get the flu vaccine, you're not going to get the flu. It just means that your body is more prepared to handle the flu, right? So that leads me to my story of, um, of getting, getting COVID after nearly, okay, it's a T, TDAP. That, thank you, Stephanie. Um, words are flying around in my head. Um, if some of y'all were here earlier, you heard my story of what happened on Friday with some of my students, that's a different story. Anyways, so I avoided COVID-19 for two years, two years. And when I say two years, I mean two years since it arrived in the United States, because as we know, COVID popped up overseas for the first time in mid to late 2019. It didn't really hit. It wasn't really start. It didn't start to become prevalent in the United States until early 2020. So I have avoided this virus for two years using safety precautions and living the life of a hermit. So fast forward to um, after Christmas break. So right before Christmas, the winter holidays, we started hearing of this new variant, right, of Omicron. And everybody's sick of hearing about variants, right? And even during the holidays this year, I had um, let down my guard a little bit more than I had in the last almost two years. Um, June and I had gone to um, his family's house, but they're all vaccinated, whatever. Um, and so I come back and I should preface this also with, I work in a building with 2000 kids, 2000 teenagers to be more specific. And God knows I love teenagers, but teenagers are absolutely disgusting individuals. And I mean, like, physically disgusting like you think little kids are bad um at least with little kids you can be like hey now i'm gonna help you wash your hands um teenagers are like doing this in class and like chewing with their mouths open and like all of the stuff right um it's like babies babies part two um except they're in giant bodies so I work in a building with over 2000 kids. Um, we have about 300 staff members. I could more or less. And everybody comes back after Christmas break. Um, everybody comes back after Christmas break. We have, you know, a few folks out here and there. And we'll take what's what I'm about to say as day zero. So Monday that we come back, it's just teachers. We all come back, we all greet each other, whatever. Teachers, for the most part, are really good about wearing the masks. Um, and Monday or Monday happens, so that is day one. That is day one of exposure. Because the teacher next door to me, who is a also a science teacher, he's a chemistry teacher, he comes and says, oh, my one and a half year old is sick. We're not quite sure yet if it is COVID or not. So comes along Tuesday, he's making plans, students are back, he's making plans to be out the rest of the week because they did get their child's test results back and said, um, our kid has COVID. We don't have COVID, we've tested negative, all of this stuff, um, but we're gonna stay home with her the whole week. So that is day two, or that's day one. So first day, zero exposure day, day one, um, he comes back, says, I'll be gone for the rest of the week. Wednesday rolls around and I get word along with my, my colleagues that we're all, we're all pretty close in our little tight knit science um, bubble up, up on the third floor that my colleague has tested positive, but is on the lower end of the threshold for COVID. Meaning he is asymptomatic more than likely he has low viral threshold in his body um, due to test results, but he has COVID. 
So now it is official. I have had a positive COVID exposure. I'm like, that's fine. I wear my mask. I wash my hands, whatever, what have you. So I, I get tested on Wednesday because it's been two days. So it's been 48 hours since my first known exposure. And I get the test at work because our workplace, um, if you are not vaccinated, the option is to get tested. And But this was a free clinic that was open to all of us, but they have the clinic because of unvaccinated workers at school. I get tested on Wednesday. It comes back Friday as negative. But as Jude can tell you, on Friday, after I getting home from work, I was very, very sick, very terrible cough, very terrible headache, um, very sleepy, which is not unusual for yours truly. I probably was a koala in my previous life. Friday, I am still testing negative. It is not until Sunday where my mother brings me a rapid antigen test. And let me tell you, as somebody who has worked with um, a multitude of different chemical tests as such, I have never seen anything in my life come back more positive and more clear as a test result than my, <laughs> my antigen test. So it's official. It's Sunday, the Sunday after first exposure, almost seven days after first exposure, I am positive. I do not go in to work that week. Um, still kind of in shock that I have COVID. Uh, I have taken all the precautions. I am vaccinated. I am boosted. I wear my mask. I limit exposure to the outside universe. And I'm going to tell you, it was not fun. Um, it could have been worse. Um, I got the heavy chest thing. My throat was constantly sore. Sitting on the sofa, literally doing nothing except existing. Um, it felt like I was climbing out of the Grand Canyon. And I can tell you from experience, I have had to hike the Grand Canyon multiple times for work. Um, in previous jobs, I was sat on my sofa. So fast forward to either, I believe it was Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, it was, as the CDC has said, five days after onset of symptoms and all this uh, you should be fine. You should be good to go now, right? That is their guidelines. Uh, I get tested and the test comes back of critical values of having a viral load. So I get my test results back within 24 hours. It is a PCR test. And so when you, if you see that on a COVID test, that doesn't mean that you are just positive. Critical values means that if something is going to go wrong, you, it is going to go really wrong because your viral load is much higher than the typical threshold for having the sickness is. So if you get an abnormal test result back, that means you are just sick, you have COVID. If you get a critical test result back, that means you have the potential to be hospitalized. Like this can get worse. So this is this is this is following the CDC guidelines. I have critical values, critical viral load of COVID-19 after the CDC has said, hey, like after five days, you should be fine. It was not until another week from that day where I got my second very, uh, very positive um, COVID test to where I started testing negative again and was able to go back to work. Um, so all that to say, what is what is my actual message here? So let me, let me go over to, not this, sorry, y'all. Y'all just seeing my whole, whole messy life on my computer today that you didn't need to. So my whole message here is, well, part of it is, if I was not vaccinated and I was not boosted, I absolutely guarantee you that I would have been hospitalized. I felt like shit and it was not a good time but I can tell you for almost absolute certainty that if I had not been vaccinated, 
and I had not been protecting myself in the way I had been with my mask and everything, it would have been far worse. Um, which good to know, right? Uh, that the, my vaccine is working that my body had had the opportunity to. My second point here is just because you are vaccinated does not give you, and I'm not trying to make accusations here. I'm trying to give you a nice warning that just because you are vaccinated, this is not over. Um, this is not like that should not be the only precaution you're taking. And there is evidence to support that folks that who are boosted have a harder time transmitting um, Omicron virus to other people. So it's kind of like a stopgap, um, which I am fortunate to have because I'll be quite honest with you. Um, I was very, very close to other folks even before I knew it, I had a positive and those folks are also boosted and they didn't get it, fortunately, which is great. But that's not to say that just because there's that stopgap that you have your vaccine, that just because you don't end up hospitalized doesn't mean that you're not going to end up hospitalizing somebody else. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to end up hospitalizing somebody who also did the right thing by getting vaccinated, who's been wearing a mask. Um, this virus is super transmissible. And I just wanted to end with this nice little chart here of the different variations. So the WHO, I don't, I'm not messing around with the CDC anymore because they're a hot mess that need to get themselves sorted out. The WHO, oh, the World Health Organization says that Omicron is a, a very high risk. And if you look at this chart, you'll see the different variations and where they all showed up that Omicron, ain't, it's not messing around. Um, this virus is not becoming less transmissible. It's not becoming less dangerous. Um, that's not how um, natural selection evolution work and mutations work. So my final message is, please, please, please just keep doing the right thing. I know it's a hot mess and it's a giant nuisance, but you're going to end up killing off somebody, whether it's intentional or not intentional. And if it's intentional, don't tell me. I don't want to have to be the one that goes on Dateline and be like, I knew so-and-so. Yeah, they would never, they would never purposely kill anybody. Don't make me be that guy. Um, I don't want to be. So that's my story about um, surviving COVID-19. I'm still having um, potentially long haul symptoms that go along with it. My breathing's not back to where it should be. I am still chronically fatigued. Um, and I've had, I've had a lot of issues with um, a potentially undiagnosed um, inflammatory joint disorder um, that has started to be more severe since um, the onset of my COVID symptoms. So that was very long-winded. Um, I'm just trying to tell y'all, I get it. Y'all are sick of everything. I'm sick of it too. But please, please, please keep keep up your um, your safety measures because you're not only going to save your life, you're going to save other people's lives too. So if you ever have any questions about stuff, I'm not a vi virologist. Um, I am a scientist. Y'all, y'all know that by now. Um, I'm more than happy to have these conversations. Uh, no question is too dumb. Um, like folks heard earlier in the day, and you can all plug your ears, it's a little bit PG-13. I had a student searching about on a school laptop why their ejaculate was chunky earlier this week. Um, and I had to have that conversation with them to make it a teachable moment. So if you think your question is dumb, let me tell you I've heard worse. Uh, so please, please ask, right? And thank you, Jocelyn. I am feeling I'm feeling tons better now. So on that note, if you would like to be a community moment and you want to be the fool up here saying words, 
please reach out to Mark Dixon or myself. We can get you set up. We would love to hear from you. All right. And so on that note, I'm going to put you all into breakout rooms. And if you have never been here before and you don't know what breakout rooms are, you are going to have four to five people in your breakout room. It is like a PG chat roulette. You get who you get. That's it. And y'all can stare, stare at each other, go get a cup of coffee, uh, talk about how ridiculous all the information I just told you was or what have you. So we will see you all back here in about 10 minutes and hope you all have some good conversations.
All right, welcome back. I think everybody's back. Oh, we still have a few more folks filtering in. So I hope that you all had a fruitful breakout room time slash coffee break. So we do that every Sunday. And like I said, chat, chat roulette. New friends, old friends, somewhere in between, maybe some enemies, who knows? And without further ado, I will introduce, reintroduce Rick. So if Jason, if you can switch on over and I will stop talking. Hello. The interesting thing about the breakout is since I have two cameras, I was in two different breakout rooms. So I could see you in one and the other one that I could hear the other people. So I apologize to the people in the breakout that is this camera. <laughs> so anyway, um, here we go. We'll see what happens. Ah. You're getting, you're getting some, some lovely silent applause. And that's what we like to see here at, at Oasis. I see this. Thank you. So I think you've got one more for, for us at the end Mm -hmm. here. 
Um, but before we transition over, is there anywhere locally we can see you um, coming up or um, are there any going to be like live recordings anytime soon? What's, what's, what, do you, what do you have going on? I actually have an album I finished during COVID um, sitting on my couch for four months or whatever it was. Uh, I just recorded everything I did and I called the album Ephemera because it was completely of the moment absolutely no editing it was like okay i like that chunk i like that chunk and then i created a full album out of that so that's that's available by cd it's available spotify apple all of that um i just finished playing for the oakland park arboretum uh for the luminary walk it goes on for two months and it's the coolest gig ever um but it's also at night outside in November and December. So it gets super cold. Um, I don't have anything coming up now though. Um, not, not right now. COVID has really affected things. Um, I'm just now at the point where I'm starting to do stuff again. So um, yeah, no, what I've got right now is a CD. Well, I think Jason's been been plugging stuff, so maybe he can drop the link link to your to your album in there soon. And um, well, thank you again for being here. I know we're gonna hear from you one last time at the end. And yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And if anybody has questions, whenever I'm happy to at, answer them separately or in the group or whatever. So awesome, you you heard that. So if you got questions for Rick feel free to put him in the chat because he's he's got his eyeball on it. All right, thank you. We will hear from you soon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, unless he's gone and run away already. Mark Phillip is a comedian based out of Ohio, specifically Bowling Green, Ohio. And anecdotally, um, Mark and I originally met on my 27th birthday some years ago. Um, I was having a little rough go of things. Uh, my friend took me to one of his comedy shows at Grumpy Dave's, and it's been a weird friendship ever since. Um, and now I offer him money, and sometimes he comes and uh, tells us comedy things. So, Jason, if we can get Mark up, that would be, that would be awesome. And Mark has to turn on his camera for, oh, he has it on. I see him. There we go. Welcome, Mark. Where's the cat? Where's the new cat today? She's hanging out somewhere. Okay. Probably, and there's in a probably yeah, um, destroying something you love. Uh, she's being suspiciously quiet. That's, that's what um, cats are about. Yeah. So, um, we well, I will... <laughs> I will hand over the floor to you, because uh, obviously you're the part-time comedian, part-time uh, mattress <laughs> manager, and uh, Jason will shut me up so you can do your thing. Am I? Uh, am I? Am I allowed to curse, or like, should I not? Or would, if I if I told you not to curse, would that stop you? Yeah, I'm respectful. Um, I mean, you, I. You do what your heart desires. You, okay. you, you know who I am. Do you think I'm going to stop you from cursing? I don't think, no. Not even if you wanted to. Yeah, the, there, there we go. All right, Mark, take it away. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, um, I know this is like a, like a secular organization. And that's, a little bit, that's a little bit strange for me to be here because I'm, I'm a Buddhist. Um, but it's... Uh, uh, I don't know. It works for me. It's like, you know, the, the Buddha said that one of the most important tenets of, uh, of your own spiritual growth is to, is to not form attachments, which gives me like a really good excuse, like not to call somebody back after a one night stand. Uh, <laughs> I have a, I have a friend. I have a friend who's uh, very proud of the fact that his grandfather served in World War II. And he says all the time, like, uh, you guys should respect me and my grandfather because my grandfather died for your freedom. You know, my grandpa died for your freedom. 
and I don't know, man. I feel like if uh, I feel like if he knew what I was going to do with my freedom, he would have changed his mind about that. <laughs> like you know, your I don't know, your grandfather died in World War II so that I could uh, pay $45 to have my own naked body printed on a body pillow that I snuggle with every night to work on my self-esteem. Your grandfather was killed behind enemy lines so I could lie to my therapist every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Your grandfather took a bullet in the trenches of Deutschland so that I could blow raspberries every time I eat pussy. Is that what your grandfather died for? It's called the moist harmonica. <laughs> See, these things are normally uh, pretty awkward, uh, but it's even, it's even worse when it's just like to yourself. <laughs> there was this uh, lady in the breakout room who said that she hopes my act is as good as my pecs, and I don't, I think she's going to be really disappointed by the rest of this. Um, <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, I'm a big fan. I'm not a fan, not a fan of Jeffrey Dahmer. That's a bad phrasing of it. Uh, but I like, I like the Jeffrey Dahmer story. I think uh, as far as serial killers go, he was a very interesting one. One of the things that always strikes me about his story is um, – uh, is that he committed his murders in an apartment building. You know, he had neighbors on either side and above and below him, and he had a landlord. He had all that, right? And he was he was slaughtering and cannibalizing people there, and he got away with it for a very long time. He had a lot of victims. And when they finally caught him, um, they found plans in his apartment for uh for this shrine that was going to go up in his living room you know and it was going to be uh it was going to be like two full skeletons on either side it was going to be like a chandelier made out of skulls and a black table and there was going to be like a throne behind it and, and candles it was going to be this whole thing and uh he told the arresting officers uh if you guys had gotten here six weeks later you would have found that bone shrine in my living room And that's insane to me because, like, I, I don't know. My landlord doesn't know I have a cat. Like, if, if I need maintenance done in my place, I got to call a friend that I trust to watch her for two days. I don't know if I have any friends that I like enough and trust enough to take care of my bone shrine. You know, serial killers are not smart. That's a, that's a cultural misunderstanding. That's a pop culture myth. Uh, Serial killers tend to be a little bit on the dumber side, you know, like one of uh, one of the most famous ones, Ted Bundy. He's kind of he's kind of known for being like, you know, the, the prototypical, uh, uh, extremely charming, charismatic kind of serial killer. But that guy, he got caught the first time because he was speeding and he got pulled over with a bunch of murder tools in his truck. And then he escaped from prison. And then he got caught the second time speeding <laughs> with a bunch of murder tools in the trunk. Serial killers aren't smart. The only, uh, the only smart serial killer there's ever been was Jack the Ripper. And Jack the Ripper never got caught. And you know why? Because he committed his murders in the year 1888. And what was so special about that year is that that's the year that they invented the ballpoint pen, which was very distracting. <laughs> I'm just saying, I think John Wayne Gacy could have gotten away with it if he had started killing kids around like when the iPhone came out. Um, I want to talk about racism. I know that's it's a scary thing to hear a to hear a white man to hear a white man say, um, but I want to I want to talk about racism a little bit. I think um, this might be a controversial statement, but I think that not only is it uh, not only is it possible uh, to be racist against white people, uh, but I think it's a lot of fun too. 
I think it's the most fun that you could probably have being racist if I had to pick. Because, you know, uh, if somebody, if you're, if you're being racist towards a white person and they get offended, that's the funniest thing on the planet because how dare they? <laughs> like, bro, if being white is the worst thing that you have going for you, you have an incredible life. <laughs> I have a, I got a friend, used to be a friend. He, he said something to me about, about race and, and white. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, I, uh, it bothers me. That he said this, not me. He said, it bothers me that white people uh, get so much flack for being school shooters. You know, uh, and the second sentence that, <laughs> the second sentence was, the best one was an Asian kid. <laughs> and I was like, hold up. <laughs> back up let's 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 take that piece by piece when you say the best one <laughs> and he goes yeah that's the one with the high score and i was like okay <laughs> we'll come back to that and i'm like and then and then the best one was was an asian kid and he goes yeah of course it was an asian kid and i was like stop what do you mean by that what do you mean of course it was an asian kid <laughs> and he goes i shit you not he goes Asians are good at math. There's no way a white kid would have ever been able to calculate the trajectory of all those bullets. I have another friend who's, um, he, he's black. He's my only black friend. I'm kidding. Um, but he, uh, he went to an all black school. And he told me this story about how uh, when he was in high school, uh, one of the students came into his English class and uh, popped off a couple rounds. And, uh, you know, thankfully, nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed. Uh, still a very traumatic experience. Right. And, um, and, I, and I, I spoke to him about that. I said, wow, that's that's incredible, man. You you survived a school shooting. That's an incredible thing to, that's an incredible thing to have in your experience. Horrifying, but an incredible, uh, you know, uncommon experience. And he goes, no, 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 no. See, I didn't survive a school shooting. See, we, we were black. So when you're black, they just call it gang violence. <laughs> euphemisms. That's a, that's a white urge. White people love euphemisms. Uh, we, we love euphemisms to... Uh, make ourselves feel better and to hurt other people just the same just twisting the language around until it until it works in our favor we love doing that let me give you an let me give you a personal example okay I lived um, I made a lot of mistakes in my life and uh, at one point for about a year I lived in this house that uh, I was given a little like you know 10 foot by 10 foot room to call my own I had a uh, I had a deflated air mattress on the floor. I had no other furniture, and I had all my clothes in a pile. And if I wanted to lock the door to my room when I left, I had to take the doorknob with me. The entire house was in just a state of horrendous disrepair. Everything was peeling off the walls. Everything was breaking. I had at least eight roommates sometimes 12 people came and went it was basically a glorified squatting what was going on there uh they had parties every single weekend and the parties were, were loud and rambunctious and there would be a new stranger in our bathtub every saturday morning um and the guy that owned the place that we all paid our uh, our 75 dollars rent to the guy that owned the place uh was one of the city's most uh most impressive drug dealers essentially he had the he had the the biggest share of the market in our town and you know uh anywhere else yeah you know that house anywhere else that's a trap house they would call that a trap house anywhere else but everybody that lived there was white so we called it an art collective <laughs> Uh, 
I don't live there anymore. I have this now. And uh, it, this is kind of a mess right now because I'm uh, I'm moving again in a month. I finally got my shit together and got my credit score fixed up. So I'm, I'm moving into a condo in about a month. Um, I've been sober for about four years, which is fine. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not fun. Uh, I'm bored a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's some white people shit at condo. <laughs> But I used to, um, I used to go to these uh, AA, AA meetings. AA meetings. I uh, I stopped going, but I used to go. And um, I, I hope you guys like me because they didn't think I was funny at all, whatsoever. There was just they, they were a lot of like just like the weight of the past was fucking up their posture. Like they didn't like to smile. It felt like it was against the rules there. Um, but we were in a church. A lot of AA meetings are very Christian themed, and this one was in a church. And that's fine. That doesn't bother me whatsoever. But um, at this particular one, we were not allowed to use the main room of the church. We had to use this room off to the side that was a little bit more sectioned in, a little more closed off. And uh, they didn't let us move any of the chairs. <laughs> and that was the strangest thing to me. I was always asking, like, why, why can't we move the chairs? And one day, one of the representatives of the church came in and I asked him, why aren't we allowed to move the chairs? Well, like, even if we move them back after the meeting, why can't we move the chairs? And uh, he said, just in case there's a, an emergency funeral. And like, correct me if I'm wrong, but if there's a funeral happening, the emergency part's over, right? <laughs> Unless this church knows something that I don't. Because I grew up in the kind of religious environment where we believed in vampires. So I stopped going to AA. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of love. I like love a lot. Uh, I can't figure it out. I can't get love right. I keep trying. And every time I feel like I'm, I'm like almost there and I almost have it, then it like, it like slips from my grasp a little bit or I freak out and I ruin it. Um, so I seek, uh, I seek guidance on love from uh, other people that I feel might have been more, might have been more accomplished in that regard. And um, there's this friend of mine, she's, uh, she's divorced. <laughs> but ever since she got divorced, she seemed a much happier person and she's, she's been happier with the people that she's dated after that. Um, she's had three boyfriends since she got divorced. Now the first one, was in a wheelchair and you know we didn't think anything of it whatever the second boyfriend after her divorce was also in a wheelchair okay you got to type <laughs> and then the third boyfriend after her divorce was also in a wheelchair and then that's when we all had a bunch of questions right and we sat at her side i brought her i brought her and i said jen i'm not trying to accuse you of uh, fetishizing the disabled i'm not doing that but we noticed, <laughs> we noticed that each one of these guys after your divorce has been in a wheelchair. So is there a reason for that? And uh, she said, you know, going through a divorce, you, you learn what you really, you learn what you want out of a relationship. And the reason that my marriage ended is because that guy that I was married to, we would get into arguments and he would beat me. And now when we get into arguments, I just go upstairs. And she said, Mark, I have, I have a motto now. My motto is, if he can't reach you, he can't beat you. <laughs> and it's so, sometimes love is that simple. Sometimes love is very complicated, though. I feel like, in my experience, it's complicated. I love my cat. Don't get me wrong. I love this cat very much. But she is... She's difficult. She's, she's still a kid. And um, I don't know. I like, I like being a pet owner because it's a different kind of love and it teaches you, it teaches you about yourself. It teaches you, um, it teaches you that like at the, you do deserve love, at least in some form, you're able to earn that. You know, it, it teaches you that you're not all evil or bad. It, it, um, uh, it teaches you that there, there are situations and there are, 
there are creatures that have empathy that can that can reach out towards you and and can can lead you down a path towards actual forgiveness if you're able to open up your heart to it and uh but most importantly what she taught me is that i think i've been way too judgmental of uh people that like drown their babies in bathtubs you know like um all right, let me let me give you an example let me okay so i i get up at eight o'clock in the morning because there's a tiny predator on my chest screaming for food i get up and i give her food and she's screaming the entire time that i'm giving her food she's silent for five minutes while she eats the food and then she starts screaming again i go to work i work a 10-hour shift i come back she's screaming at me for food i give her food she's screaming at me the entire time she's silent for five minutes while she's eating and then she starts screaming again and then I leave, I go do a comedy show out in bumfuck Michigan and somebody yells at me and then I get punched by a heckler after the show because they didn't let me finish my punchlines. So they assume I'm, a bad, I'm as bad of a person as the first half of my jokes make me sound. And then I go home and there's a tiny predator screaming at me. <laughs> and she, I give her her food and she's good for about five minutes. And then, uh, and then she starts screaming at me again. And then I give her a little bit of kitty melatonin because you got to drug the cat sometimes so you can get to sleep. And that puts her to sleep. And I get about three hours of sleep. And now it's four o'clock in the morning. And then there's a tiny predator sitting on my chest, screaming at me and running around the apartment as quickly as she can. And then finally, I grab her and I go, honey, typhoid. I named her typhoid. That's a disease that you get when you eat food prepared by people who don't wash their hands after they take a shit. And I grab her and I go, typhoid, the only reason that you are alive is because I allow you to be. And then she throws up on my pillow. Now, now all that, right? But it's a human. So it's louder for longer you're not allowed to leave it home alone when you go to work. And every day, it looks a little bit more like the man who left you. I'm not saying it's the right decision. I'm just saying I get it. Um, I, was watching a, I was watching a documentary about... Um, I was watching a documentary about a guy who was, uh, he was a thousand pounds and he was trapped in his bed and he couldn't leave. And um, they kept, uh, they kept cutting to interviews with his wife. And she was like, um, I just don't know what to do. This is, uh, this is the man that I love so much. You know, I, I love my husband so much. And every day when he asks me to bring him food, uh, I bring him the food and I just don't know what to do. I just don't know how to help him. And I wanted to pull her aside and be like, honey, like just when you bring him the food, just, just leave it at the door. And if he gets mad, I, a wise woman once told me that if he can't reach you, <laughs> I should have learned guitar instead of whatever the hell this is. Cause like, you know, you try really hard, to like communicate with people. You try really, really hard to um, organize your thoughts in, in a way that people can understand. It doesn't make you seem like an alien to them. <laughs> but it's just, it just never seems to work right. You know, when you do comedy, people don't like it. <laughs> If I had learned guitar, I could like play, uh, I could play a sad song and nobody would be offended by that. But if I tell a sad joke, then uh, you, I'm, I'm ruining somebody's evening if I do it, you know? It doesn't stop me though. <laughs> My therapist is retiring in a month and I'm having a hard time with that. I'm gonna get out of here on this. Um, uh, sometimes my uh, my day job, I don't do this for a living. Are you shocked? 
sometimes my day job uh, takes me out to other cities and I have to spend the weekend in some other cities. And uh, they uh, they always pay for my hotels. And there was this one time I was out in Cleveland, which is where I'm from originally. I grew up in the Cleveland area. I don't live there anymore because I got a lot of bad, you know. But I was out there at uh at just some just some shitty hotel and uh i'm i'm sitting in my car in the parking lot of the hotel and like i'm sitting in my car in the parking lot of this hotel and i'm looking across the street and as i'm looking across the street this deer comes out of the woods that are right across the street from this hotel and it's it's stepping very gingerly across the street and i'm just I, I just make eye contact with it i just have a good time with the deer and i i I'm, I'm a vegetarian i'm kind of an animal lover i just love watching it and then a car comes screaming out of the out of the bend slams into the deer stops for five seconds and then speeds off again and the deer is still alive but its legs aren't working. And I just, I watched this thing drag itself with what's left of its front limbs off of the street, trying desperately to get back towards the woods. But it's going so slow and it's so painful for it, it can't make it. And then a few minutes later, I see, I see one cop show up. And then I see two cops show up. And then I see three cops and they, they all come out of their cars and they all, they all crowd around this deer. They make a, they make a nice little semicircle around the deer and this deer is still struggling. And they're talking silently amongst themselves. And one of the cops kind of nods and then he, he goes back to his car. He opens up the trunk, he pulls out a shotgun. And then I just, I watch him walk very slowly. And I don't know what I was expecting. But as soon as he gets in front of the deer again, he pumps the shotgun and blasts it in the face. And, you know, like, I always been an artist, you know, always been an artist, always wanted to figure out ways to to express ex express like feelings that are very hard for me to put into words and somehow some way uh making jokes out of that has 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 been the way that I've learned how to do it and I've thought about this deer this deer getting shot in the face in front of me I've thought about watching this thing's last moments for over a year now <laughs> trying desperately to to form a joke around this i've been doing comedy for 10 years i have a writing degree i'm good at this i know i am and after a year of ruminating over this this deer all i've come up with is the buck stops here <laughs> that's my time guys thank you very much Well, first off, you ran away before I could say this. Uh, so thank you so much, Mark, for being here um, on a Sunday. Uh, holy shit, that was a, a lot. Um, and I, I think most folks appreciated it. I saw about six people run away. Um, so you know better than your average Tuesday night at Grumpy's probably. Um, and second of all, I know the exact house you're talking about because I dated somebody who lived in that house and um, holy shit, uh, we, we all come full circle in life. So um, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, if you come back, because I see your little black screen and you would like to drop a link to, I think you have a comedy album. I think I saw that you were gonna write another one soon. You're welcome to drop that info in the chat. 
Yeah. I, oh, I'm you're gonna back. Clean, I'm going to clean oh, you're, off. You're cleaning off your, uh, your blood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will let you get clean because uh, I know you got to get to work. But um, if you can give us your information for your, for your um, comedy album later, that would be awesome. So, <laughs> so on that note, uh, before I ask Rick to come back up, I would not be doing my job if I did not say this. I am contractually obligated to say Kansas City Oasis is a 501c3. That not only means that we are a nonprofit, that means we are completely volunteer run and we are completely donation run. run. So if you would like to donate to us so we can continue to have these programs, you can go to kcoasis.org slash donate. And you can either sign up to be a monthly donor or you can donate one time. Um, and that's what I've got for you. So thank you to our comedian today, Mark. Thank you to Rick. And I will let Rick take us away for this afternoon. So Jason, if you can swap us over, that would be great. There we go. I think I'm unmuted now. Let me see. Okay. I don't know if you guys have noticed yet, but everything I play is by feel, so it just kind of happens. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> go 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Rick. And keep us updated on what you're up to, because I know the rest of the community would like to keep hearing those updates. Thank you. So with that, that is it for, for this weekend. Y'all have a good week. Stay safe and see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Have a good afternoon.